let me begin by saying that I'm uh, Ray Horton. I'm the director of the Social Enterprise Program at Columbia Business School. And as always, I'm happy and honored to have the opportunity to welcome you to our annual reception. This is the eighth annual reception of the Social Enterprise Program, but if you go back to the origins of the public and nonprofit program, which preceded the Social Enterprise Program, it is the 25th annual reception. Uh, the first order of business this evening is to present the Lambert Family Teaching Award for excellence in the social enterprise classroom. We give this award annually to the Columbia Business School faculty member who rolled up the best evaluations in the previous year. And fittingly, I'm going to ask Sheila and Bill Lambert, who um, not only have supported this award, but have been uh, long-standing, um, continual supporters of the social enterprise program, uh, most recently uh, providing the funding for a chair for my good friend, colleague, and director of the social enterprise uh, research program, Professor Ray Fisman, who is somewhere in the crowd. Um, Bill and Sheila, would you come forward? Uh, it's our pleasure to give this award to Melissa Berman. Melissa, uh, CEO of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, an organization that distributed last year $200 million in grants. Uh, this, she teaches strategic philanthropy here, and this is the first time somebody has taught a course and then gotten the award immediately after teaching the course. So it's a great return on our investment in terms of developing a course, and Melissa will be back not in the spring, but spring a year from now, because as we went through a little while back, her daughter is applying to college. So she has different priorities right now. But um, it's our pleasure, and Melissa, would you please come up here? Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Bill and Sheila, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to uh, be here with you and to be recognized for the work that uh, so many people in the city do in philanthropy, which I have the privilege to be helpful in and to be able to talk about. Um, I really like to uh, thank uh, Columbia and the Social Enterprise Program for the opportunity to teach a course on philanthropy. Um, philanthropy, as most of you know, means uh, basically uh, the love of humankind, um, and I'm fortunate that this evening two members of humankind that I love the most are here, and I want to thank my uh, husband and my daughter for their support. Um, I want to thank so many of my colleagues who helped develop this course, some uh, wonderful speakers who um, helped contribute to the development of this philanthropy course and who spoke with the students, including Russ Carson, who's here tonight, uh, also made this course a wonderful opportunity. Um, I want to thank all the students who participated with, with such great enthusiasm. And most importantly of all, I'd like to thank Professor Ray Horton, who, who recruited, coached, and mentored me through this entire process of teaching here at Columbia Business School. Uh, thank you all very much. Almost every leading business school now has a program that teaches students how to apply their skills to the solution of business, social problems. 
Columbia stands out in several regards, probably uh, most tellingly in the broad conception we have of how social enterprise can be practiced. We prepare students for socially beneficial careers in business, in government, and in the nonprofit sector because we recognize that no single sector has a monopoly on the social enterprise space. But we also recognize that partnerships among the three sectors bring added value to the solution of social problems. It's an old saw, but it's true that partnerships make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. There is no more outstanding example of this principle at work than the changes that are occurring in New York City's public schools because of the partnership of outstanding public leaders like Joel Klein, outstanding nonprofit leaders like David Saltzman, and outstanding business leaders like Russ Carson. Before introducing Russ, who will in turn introduce Joel Klein and David Saltzman, I want to recognize how the renaissance of the city schools in recent years has affected the career choices of Columbia Business School students. In the years before Mayor Bloomberg put education reform at the top of his municipal priorities, and enlisted Joel Klein to lead the effort. Almost no graduates of the Columbia Business School were interested in working in the local educational sector. That's no longer the case. Every year, some of Columbia Business School's most distinguished graduates go to work in the Department of Education or in the growing charter school movement. A dozen or so such alumni are with us tonight. I also note that the number of business school students who take the education lab consulting course increases every year. This spring, the course is sold out with 24 business school students, some of whom will follow in the footsteps of the alumni who are with us this evening. Now, it is my great honor to introduce Russ Carson. Uh, his bio in tonight's program occupies 25 plus lines. It spells out a distinguished career in business and a distinguished career as philanthropist and as trustee in the nonprofit sector. I will simply say that to me, Russ epitomizes the best of Columbia Business School. So, Russ, if you'll take a look from here. Thank you very much, Ray, and, and good evening. Uh, by epitomizing the best of Columbia Business School, I think Ray meant that my job is to stay as quiet as possible. My, my job is to ask questions of our two guests and see if we can uh, uh, elicit some information that might be of interest to all of you. Uh, with us tonight are, are two people that I would uh, say deserve right, to be right at the top of the New York City Hall of Fame in terms of the contributions that they have made and are making to New York City. Uh, on my left is uh, Joel Klein, who as all of you know is Chancellor of the New York City Public School System. Uh, Joel runs the largest school system in the nation. A uh, very large system with, uh, I guess, over, uh, well, several hundred thousand employees. Uh, over a million kids go through the system. A uh, budget of $16 billion a year, huge operation. And uh, Joel left uh, a, a short-lived career at private enterprise to, uh, to take the job as chancellor of schools. Uh, on the far left is, is David Saltzman, who is the executive director of the Robin Hood Foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know Robin Hood, uh, last year Robin Hood raised uh, $140 million uh, for philanthropy, all of which it, it then invested back into the city uh, trying to address the issue of how do we alleviate poverty in, in New York City. Uh, truly an extraordinary organization. David has been the executive director for 17 years now, David. And uh, so I think he deserves all of the credit for what's going on there. What we're going to talk about tonight is, is how the private sector and the public sector can work together and why it makes sense to have public-private partnerships 
and uh, in particular, how can that fit uh, in the world of education? I'm going to start by asking a question which I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists to address. And uh, that's a very simple question, which is, why is education important? Why, why, should, why should we care about education? Why do you care about education? And Joel, I'm going to ask you to address that first. Well, I, I think it's important in, in ways that are obvious to every human being out there. You think about what education did to your life. You think about the teachers who changed your lives. You think about the knowledge that you developed. And to me, for the country, for the city, education is important for two reasons. One, we have a racial and ethnic achievement gap in this country that is the greatest shame of this great nation. The idea that skin color or poverty or anything like that can determine the quality of the education you get is wrong. Fine for rich people to have bigger houses, larger cars, more diamonds and all of that. But a better education is morally wrong, and we have got to change that in America. Now, that moral issue takes on, I think, another dimension as we move forward in an increasingly globalized, competitive economy. And I think it's going to create enormous economic challenges for our nation. We cannot have an education underclass in an increasingly competitive global economy. If you watch what's going on in the rest of the world, quite literally, there are people out there looking to eat our lunch. And if we don't get smart, we'll cooperate with those people. David, how would you answer that question? I'd agree with everything that Joel said, which is what I'm going to do all night. Uh, <laughs> He's one of the smartest people I have ever met. Really, I mean, <laughs> bachelor number two. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we live in the greatest city in the world, in some ways the richest city in the world, and yet last year more than half of the babies born in New York City were born into poverty. And one thing that all three of us agree on is that children can learn their way out of poverty. If we do a good job of providing kids with decent educations, they can learn their way out of poverty. Education is the single best poverty-fighting tool that we have. Joel, you've been very successful at uh, engaging the philanthropic community and, and supporting the public school system. Those aren't two things that one would normally think would go together. Normally, they're, they're viewed as separate functions, that the school system would be funded and run by the, the public sector. Uh, private philanthropy would be devoted to, to issues other than uh, public education. How have you been so successful in, in engaging philanthropy, and, and what have you used that philanthropy for in, in the school system? Sure. I, I think we have been uh, successful. We, we've now raised, uh, over the course of my five and a half years, somewhere around $350 million of private philanthropy. I think in no small measure really the credit goes to Mike Bloomberg uh, in that he did something that was politically inastute but really had an impact on the city which when he got elected mayor he said the first thing I want to do is be held accountable for public education. Now if I had been advising him I would have said don't do that. No, no, nobody wants to be held accountable for public education because nobody's transformed it and you're going to have to run again. And I think the fact that Mike stepped up and decided to show the leadership led the business community to think maybe this is a time we wouldn't be throwing money down a rat hole. The business community cares enormously about education and the philanthropic community cares enormously, but they've seen so much money invested so poorly. Second thing we did is I view this as really a combination of venture money, if you will, or you know, startup or so we didn't go to them and say, you know, help me support this program that I have. I put a billion dollars against each year and you give me another five million. Nobody thinks if I can't do it for a billion, I can't do it for a billion and five million. But if I say to you, which I said to you uh, and a lot of other people, and, and you really were leader on this, I said, look, if I don't train up a new generation of leadership, I won't be able to transform the schools. And if I try to do that on the traditional budget, I'll get killed because people will say, you know, that's money you took from an art program. So I went to the uh, uh, philanthropic and business community. We raised 70 million dollars to do that because they knew that that was basically our R&D, our venture money, and they said, I can see he could do something with it. Did the same thing with David and a lot of other people on creating an infrastructure to support charters. From day one, I wanted to expand charters. David always jokes, I'm the only monopolist he knows who <laughs> eagerly tries to bring in more competition. May say something about my foolishness, but it seems to me we need a lot more competition. And so David and a couple others, uh, uh, got together and we raised 45 million to do that. The Gates Foundation 
basically has supported us to create a whole new infrastructure to support new small high schools. We've opened up 250 million. So I think the key has been confidence that the money will be wisely invested, and certainly Robin Hood is brutal on asking those questions, <laughs> and a sense that there are things we could not do without this philanthropic support. David, uh, last year about half of the $140 million that, that Robin Hood invested in the city went into the field of education. How did you and the board of Robin Hood conclude that that was a wise thing to do with the, the money that you were raising? Well, we're lucky that we had Joel Klein as our school's chancellor. We would not have invested that much money in education if Joel didn't provide us with the opportunities to invest that money wisely. Let me tell you a, a frightening story that before Joel was chancellor, I went to one of his predecessors and I said, you know, Robin Hood would love to help you. What, what can we help you do that you couldn't otherwise do? And he said, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. Let me bring my team together and I'll get back to you. Week passed, no word from him. Two weeks passed, no word from him. Left many phone messages. Still no word. Finally, a month and a half, two months later, I was able to reach him. And he said, I, we've got a proposal. It's coming to you. A few days later, I received a proposal. And the best idea that he could come up with was $25,000 for beanbag chairs to create reading nooks <laughs> in kindergarten classes. So when you ask, why would we want to invest money in education, especially public education, it's because we have a partner who's made it possible for us to make meaningful contributions in kids' lives. Before Joel was the school's chancellor, the schools were shut off to private philanthropists for the most part. The schools were shut off to people who wanted to make a difference. We now have a terrific partner at Tweed uh, Courthouse, where Joel's offices are, and throughout the 1,400 public schools in New York City. Joel, uh, ever since you've been chancellor, you, you've been engaged in a never-ending program to try and change and reform the, uh, the system that existed when you arrived. Uh, what are the major initiatives that, that you've undertaken, and what role has, has private philanthropy uh, played in your ability to, to undertake those initiatives? You know, it's funny. I was listening when, when Ray was introducing you, and he said about all these Columbia B-School people who are now coming to the public school system. In, in my view, that is so critical to the transformation because people who are bringing entrepreneurial, innovative juices, who instinctively get accountability, who understand leadership and care deeply about management. Now, in the world of education, when I talked like that in the beginning, people looked at me like I was nuts. I mean, this, this was an alien language. And so the transformation at its core has been about a cultural transformation. And it's an understanding, for example, the first thing we did and if you don't get this, you won't get the rest. There are no great school systems. People don't send kids to a system. They send kids to a school. The unit that matters is the school. First thing we did, our logo is Children First, a system comprised of great schools. So we, we moved the entire focus to the school. And the key things we came in behind that with are very basic, but in my world, entirely transformative. Number one, school leadership matters. We changed the entire role of the principal. We invested enormously. Good teachers want to work for a good principal. Great teachers are driven out by poor leadership. A good leader sets the tone, creates the culture, sets the expectations in a building. Second thing we did was we empowered these people. Principals used to be the agent of the bureaucracy. They were like a puppet that the bureaucracy jerked on when I got there. One of the radical things I did in my first year, people couldn't believe it, I said principals have to pick their own assistant principals. Before then, the superintendent picked the principal and picked the assistant principal. And all my superintendents said, don't do that. And I said, why not? He said, our principals don't know how to pick assistant principals. And I said, if we have principals who can't pick assistant principals, the game is over. How are they gonna run a school if they can't pick their team? So we've driven so much authority and power on the theory, if you create conditions, it'll attract different human talent in that respect we borrowed from the charter movement. Third thing we've done is built the toughest accountability system because performance matters. I, I've said this to you many times. The greatest challenge I have is many people in this room believe that we'll never fix education until we fix poverty. 
and they've got it exactly backwards. And I've got to demonstrate that, in fact, education can transform lives. I've built this accountability system <clears throat> with enormous support from the private sector, Dell, Microsoft, Grove, others. I've built this system to say, here are two schools with the exact same kids, exact same poverty, exact same English language learners, exact same special ed. This school getting these gains, this school getting entirely different gains to convince the system that performance and outcomes matter. Go throughout the United States, go listen even in the current presidential debates. The basic discussion is about inputs, right? How much money do you spend? <clears throat> What's your class size? How much after school, preschool? <clears throat> but you hear very little discussion about outputs. The discussion you hear typically debunks standardized testing, which says nothing about what we should be doing. It is amazing to me that this nation doesn't have national standards, a national curriculum, and a set of criteria that says to be educated in America and graduate high school means thus and such, not a race to the bottom by increasing graduation rates through lowering standards. Those are all the kind of things that are very counterintuitive in a system that abhorred differentiation, focused on compliance, and cared most about the inputs. And we have had real success, and I give the United Federation of Teachers a great deal of credit for working with us. In New York City, unlike a lot of cities, you can no longer show up at a school and demand a position by seniority. You have to be hired by that school. That may sound surprising to people, but in most school systems, large numbers of teachers have legal right to fill a slot, whether the school, principal, anyone wants them. We've put in place one of the most exciting, it's, a, it's a, a, an early phase, but the most exciting pay for performance programs. It's school-based, involves teachers in trying to differentiate and create a profession out of teachers. We've put in place now for principals in New York City the most aggressive compensation system. I can take top-notch principals, offer them 25K a year, send them to a different school, and let them do transformation work. We just announced the first the other day. But at its core, Russ, Education is a service delivery challenge. If you don't lead it, manage it, and create the proper incentives in order to make it happen, it won't happen. That's about cultural transformation. That's why the kids from business school want to come and be a part of it. The core leaders that I have at many levels in the system now are not people who came from the ed schools, they're people who came from the business schools, people who came from the business sector. That causes me a lot of political heat, but that's just fine because if you don't inject entrepreneurialism, accountability, innovation, differentiation, all of those things, you know what? We'll continue to get the same pitiful results we've gotten for the last 50 years in American education. I know you said keep the answer short, I'm trying. <laughs> David, uh, Robin Hood has been very involved with the uh, charter school movement in New York City, and uh, you and Joel have developed a very effective partnership. And, in helping get new charter schools off the ground. Uh, a lot of people here may not know exactly what a charter school is and, and how it's funded. Could you explain what a charter school is and then explain what Robin Hood has been doing and how you and Joel have partnered with that? Sure, and Joel, you'll correct me when I stumble, right? So charter schools are public schools that enter into an agreement with the government that they get increased autonomy in return for performance in its most basic form. In New York State, you receive a five-year charter and you have to perform. And if you meet certain standards, you can continue to operate your school. And if you don't meet certain performance criteria, you can be closed down. Um, New York State provides charter schools, as many um, states do, with slightly less money than a regular district school. And in New York State, there's no money for facilities. You can imagine in New York City that not having a facility becomes a major stumbling block in, uh, in a neighborhood where there's very little real estate available. What this man has done, this is where he is the monopolist inviting in the competition, is he has helped seeded charter schools. He's provided them with not only uh, facilities, but he's also provided them with all sorts of tech technical help so that they can succeed. Um, can I show a, a very quick PowerPoint yeah, presentation please on this do. stuff? So, brought some visual aids for you. <laughs> How are your feet, by the way? <laughs> We're sitting. We're having a great time. <laughs> Happy Mardi Gras. Um, 
So let me talk for a second. I hope this works. Um, oops. About Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Um, Bed Stuy is one of the poorest neighborhoods, not just in New York City, but in the United States. One alarming statistic. One in eight men in Bedford-Stuyvesant are incarcerated each year. So a group of people came together and they said, we would like to start a charter school in Bed-Stuy that will be an all-boys school. And they received a charter for something called Excellence Academy. And they were desperate to find a home for this school. And we stumbled across this building that was built in 1880 as a public school. It was in the 1960s sold to a yeshiva, um, and then it was burned down in a mysterious fire, most probably for insurance purposes, and it became the home of nothing good. Cockfights, dogfights, drug dealing, prostitution. Um, my colleague Susan Sack, who is here with, with us tonight, saw a dead dog when we first entered this building. Um, we helped form a public-private partnership with Joel, and we were able to take this building and turn it, maybe, into the, oops, into this building. Um, one night, in another wonderful partnership, I was eating ice cream with our kids, and I was introduced to Robert Stern, the Dean of Architecture, not at Columbia, though he used to teach her at Yale, and he said, oh, you're that Robin Hood guy. I bet you have some pro bono project you'd like me to do. And I said, sure. <laughs> and, and so he became the architect on this school. And it is a fantastic school that is all about excellence. Um, and this couldn't have happened without Joel's help. But the most important thing, come on, slides, um, is in Bed-Stuy, you would expect that only 48% of third graders would read at or above grade level. And you would expect that slightly more than that, 72% of third graders would perform at or above grade level in math. But thanks to Joel and to this terrific public-private partnership at Excellence, 92% of the children read at or above grade level, and 100% perform at or above grade level in math. Now, the moral of this story is when great philanthropists, people like Russ Carson, and great civil servants, great government officials, great public servants like Joel Klein come together, they form a winning team. <laughs> Can we get copies of that last slide, David? <laughs> Joel, uh, how do you see charter schools fitting into your overall mission? No. Why are they important to you? Why have you chosen to, uh, to help them? Well, for, first of all, for the reasons that uh, David sort of touched on. I, I think systems that have competition generally work better. That's sort of the lesson of the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I would the service delivery systems where you challenge people. So when people see those numbers, I hope somebody here tonight who thought it was the kids, it was poverty, it was their family, understand that's what they've always said in Bed-Stuy. But those kids are performing at an entirely different level, and I wanted to showcase that. Second, I want my people to know that parents in high poverty neighborhoods have a choice. What, you know, all of our kids have a choice. I mean, let's be candid. You don't like the school in your community, you move to another community. If you don't like that, you can move to another state. But my neediest kids have no choice. And you know how empowering it is for these people? They wait online all night to get into a lottery to go there. Mm -hmm. Third, people who are doing different things may teach us something. None of us has a monopoly on wisdom, and a lot of things that you think are good ideas don't turn out. So not every charter is doing a great job. Many of them are doing mm -hmm. a superlative job. But that's the way you learn, the homogeneity, the bureaucracy, all the stifling qualities of public education are much less present in the system. And finally, what, what I want to do is I'm always about attracting talent. So when I see people like Excellence, Norm Atkins and his group, or David Levin and his group, or Daisha Toll and their group. When I see these people and I say, come to New York, we'll create a partnership. These people leverage themselves. You talk about social entrepreneurialism. You look at the, the Princeton website, the 13th most important alum they rank out of Princeton is Wendy Kopp, because of Teach for America. That's the kind of juice you need to bring into the system. And now in New York, in communities like Harlem, 
parents have real choice, and it's going to mm -hmm. have real repercussions for the system. So that's why we really have made it, and it's very unfashionable. Superintendents throughout the country, their first line is charter siphon money from the public school budget. The public school budget needs all the money you can get, but charters take money and children. And as long as you take our kids, you're welcome to our money. David, uh, Robin Hood is, is infamous for the uh, relentless uh, analysis it does of the organizations that it, uh, it makes grants to. As you look at your various uh, initiatives in the education area, how do you grade yourselves? Uh, how are you doing? It's a really good question. Um, I'd say we're doing pretty good. Um, pretty well, I believe is. Uh... No, that was my point. <laughs> that was my that was my point. Um, we're just doing pretty good, and I think that we're on our way to doing pretty well. Um, so, so let me let me say what I mean by that. Um, we're involved in a couple of really terrific partnerships with Joel. One that we haven't spoken about yet is we've started a new um, master's degree program for teachers and aspiring teachers that is being led by some of the best practitioners in the country. And I sat in on one of the classes this summer and we spent two hours talking about what happens in the first five minutes of a class. How do you get students seated and engaged? And it was thrilling. And unfortunately, that's the type of thing that isn't taught enough in graduate programs in education in New York City or in the United States. I don't know if that program will receive an A+, plus, but I think it's going to receive an A+. Plus. And so that's why I say we're at pretty good, and I think we're getting to pretty well. That, that's a, a critically important program. I mean, what he's trying to do, yep. which again, will be unpopular in certain circles, and God bless him, he's trying to transform what the educational uh, degree program is all about. And uh, again, by creating competition, by putting up a different model, and we've partnered because each year I hire somewhere, and some are in the room tonight, somewhere around 16, 1800 teaching fellows, and I pay for their masters. And I believe that the ed schools have really got to do two things that they're not doing well now. They've got to train people from middle class backgrounds to, who are by and large successful to get into high needs communities and navigate the challenges of the kids in those communities. If you stay up on the hill, you're not going to figure out what's happening inside the hood. And the second thing is we've got to do a much better job on content preparation. We've got to partner our ed schools with our schools of arts and sciences, and we have got to make sure that our math teachers are really superb in math, that our science teachers are superb in science, et cetera. That's what he's trying to do, and it's a guts ball move. Uh, Joel, I'm going to ask one more question of you, and, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, we've been enormously fortunate to have a period of time here where we had uh, Mike Bloomberg as mayor, Joel Klein as, as chancellor uh, of the school system. Uh, the two of you are now, you're not in your last lap yet, but you're, you're 18 months, 24 months away from uh, uh, the end of the Bloomberg tenure. What have you done to, to try and institutionalize the changes you've made, and how confident are you that, that the system won't slip backward uh, under a, a new mayor and a new chancellor? Well, first of all, thanks for your generous comments. Uh, and my hope is the next mayor and next chancellor do a far better job, frankly, than we have done. Uh, our kids really need to see accelerated progress in the system. Uh, on the other hand, the issue of sustainability that you talk about, you know, I used to have as much hair as you so I, until I started to worry about <laughs> sustainability. And then you got handsome. And then, that's right. Then, uh, this bachelor one, bachelor two thing is literally going to the top of his head, I think. So there are about three or four things that you think about when you think about sustainability and transformation. Remember when I said at the outset, Russ, that it's about the school, right? Schools create their own culture. That's why I have 1,450 schools right now. And I, 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 I think it was at Alan Patrick who I just saw here. I, I was at his house when I think I said this in the beginning of my tenure. If I get 1,400 school leaders who are on board, 
They will drive change. Remember, this is an organic process. I don't think we have 1,400, but I think we have a lot of leaders now who understand high expectations, transformation, and so forth, and they will become a powerful hydraulic. We, we now survey all of our principles, and we get the whole thing, what we do well, because I believe the bureaucracy is there to serve the schools. Till I got here, I'll tell you, the schools were there to serve the bureaucracy. It's a fundamental transformation, and I don't think the schools, the principals, and their communities will completely walk away from that. Second of all, I believe data and transparency matter. So there's a whole hullabaloo about putting a grade on a school, and it's all reductionistic. I get it but it's also very powerful. Our parents want to know that information. I think they'll continue to insist on it. And more and more, as we improve the system, people will start to say, well, why is it that school with a 72% poverty rate is getting a graduation rate of X, and that school with a 72 pro poverty rate is getting a graduation rate of 0.5 X, et cetera. So I think we've made this thing data rich, and it'll continue to support accountability. The third thing that we've done is taking as much money as we can from the bureaucracy and giving it to the schools. The one great thing about this process is you can almost never repatriate money from the schools to the bureaucracy. You can move it from the bureaucracy to the schools. I think it's fair to say we've done about 400 million over the course of the past five years that is in the schools. It not only has the value of giving schools greater discretion and flexibility, but it means there are fewer and fewer bureaucrats running around doing the compliance game that has always driven education. Those are the key sustainable things. I also hope the citizenry is excited about it because they will insist for the next mayor and the next chancellor that we build on this. Today, I happen to write a letter. I, I got a poll that was not one of our polls, and I'm not a poll-driven guy, especially tonight on Super Tuesday. Good news is we'll find out how right or wrong the polls are. But there's a poll done by a group that is, is basically community service society. It's a long-term, well-respected poverty group in America, long before, in New York, long before I got here. They surveyed every, every year and on all sorts of poverty issues. And one of the metrics they asked, in addition to what do you think of the school system, is how do you rate your child's school? And they have three groups, high poverty, near poverty, and moderate to upper income. And from 02 when we started to 07, the number of people who gave their schools A and a B their own kids' schools, the number of kids in, in the high, in the low poverty range, the most, the poorest people, went from 24 to 64 percent. That is unimaginable. In the moderate, it went from 47 to 64, and in, uh, I mean, in, in the near poverty, 47 to 64, and in the higher, it went from uh, 59 to 67. So what you saw is everyone going up, but now for the first time, rich working class or poor in New York City, about two-thirds of every cohort thinks their kid is in a school that's worth an A or a B. That is important, and if those people scream like hell in the next election, the politicians will hear their cry. That's what you gotta count on. Great. Well, why don't we open it up to questions uh, from the audience? Does anybody have a question for either of our guests? Yes. <coughs> The best model of that is the Harlem Children's Zone at Jeff Canada. The, qu the question is basically, how do we do the zero to five problem? What, what the uh, questioner legitimately asks is, we're wasting five years, and what kind of public-private partnerships? To me, it's not the only model, but it's probably the best one out there, which is the work that Jeff Canada has done in the Harlem Children's Zone. So he's literally marked off a series of 97 blocks or something like that in Harlem in which he finds out every woman who's pregnant and enrolls her in baby college, and then follows on top of that with a program called the Harlem Gems, so that they start those kids in preschool. And then now Jeff has added charters on top of that. And what his theory, which is absolutely right and working, is we have got to maximize the use of those five years. And David and lots of other people have supported Jeff in, in the work that he's doing. And again, we, we should look at different models. The public should invest a lot more in intelligent pre-K work. Not, not just Head Start, but in intelligent pre-K work. We should extend the amount of time these kids are spending in educational or, or pre-K 
environments. And in the early grades, kindergarten, first, second, should have longer days, particularly for kids for high poverty neighborhoods, and longer years. We can show that at the end of kindergarten and the first grade, our kids in high poverty neighborhoods lose two, three months of learning that, believe me, they can't afford to lose. David, you might comment on what Robin Hood is doing in uh, early childhood education. Joel mentioned the Harlem Children's Zone's Baby College. One of the terrific things we were able to do to help Jeff is introduce him to T. Barry Brazelton, who is one of the nation's foremost pediatricians who's up at Harvard. He's the author of 34 books, had several television shows. I think many of you in this room who have raised children have relied on his advice. We introduced uh, Dr. Brazelton to Jeff, and now Harvard has come to Harlem. And so Dr. Brazelton and his team from Harlem come down and work with Jeff Canada in, on these 97 blocks in central Harlem to help poor families make sure that their children are ready when they hit kindergarten in public schools. Other questions? Yes, hi. Uh, yes. Good evening, my name is Ashley Goldberg and I've had the privilege of working in that bid community that you project on the screen. My question is directed towards Chancellor Klein. What was the intent behind the unexpected budget cuts that faced many teachers last week and what is, where is that money going that was taken from the school system? Sure. Uh, the budget cuts were unfortunate and uh, I can assure you no one uh, likes them. The intent behind it was the mayor who was responsible for the entire city saw enormous revenue shortfalls in the city of New York. Compared to our projections, if they were at this, the revenue shortfalls are like that. The mayor has in every prior cut spared us, but this time he felt the crisis was significant enough, the shortfall in revenues was significant enough that he basically imposed a 2.5% reduction this year and a 5% reduction next year. Essentially, from the city's money, about somewhere around 60%, 65% of that is in the schools, including this 350, 400 million I talked about before. We took some cuts in the bureaucracy, some cuts in our other programs, but in the end, we had to pass some cuts along to the schools. This year, most of our schools have that money in reserves. They don't have to cut programs. There's well over $200 million that is what's called unscheduled, and we're working with our schools to make sure they do this in a smart way. We'll have to see where we are next year, but just so I'm clear with you, for someone like me, budget cuts is nothing but bad news. But on the other hand, when the city's in financial uh, trouble, our job as leaders come together and to make sure that we can match revenues and uh, expenditures. If we don't, the city goes into default and the school system goes into default and they put it under a control <coughs> panel. And I, for one, think that would be the worst of all outcomes. We have a question from the other side. Yeah, hi, uh, Steve Feldman. I'm an alum of the business school, and I just want to thank you, gentlemen, for being here. My question is, as a reader just of the newspapers here in New York City, one could get the impression that the union, the teachers' union, opposes you in a lot of the things you try and do. I was wondering if you might just comment on the state of your relations and where you think that's going. That's probably for you. <laughs> you think yeah. so? Uh, that's, that's bachelor number one over here that's going to answer that question. Uh, it's actually, I, I think in all fairness, I think the teachers' union has worked very constructively with us. You know, I would like a more accelerated pace of change. That's the nature. A lot of times, and the press loves this, you know, the press thinks if there's controversy, there's readership. And don't mistake that basic profit motive in newspaper sales, controversy <laughs> and readership. So, you know, us and the union, these are the two titans, big bad government and the union. So they play up a lot of it. But with all seriousness, I, I think Randy Weingarten really led the way to this pay for performance has become a national model. A lot of other people are looking at it. She's worked with us on things like lead teachers where we pay additional monies for high need schools. We have a, a signing bonus of $15,000. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's a process thing, but I will be the first to tell you that over the course of our five and a half years, we've done a lot of constructive things with the United Federation of Teachers. I commend her leadership and I wish it would be more accelerated. That's just the nature of the dynamic. But I wouldn't overread the day-to-day -day name calling and you know all that sort of stuff. That's just what I call part of the glory of love. You give a little, <laughs> take glory a little. Well, you know that song, you give a little, <laughs> take a little, and let your poor heart break a little. That's a little <laughs> bit like our relationship. 
David, uh, you know a lot about what's been going on in charter schools where there, there are no unions. What do you see as the difference between a unionized uh, teacher workforce and a non-unionized teacher workforce? Um, school leaders get to completely choose their faculty. They can hire and fire their team. They can set longer hours. They can pay more money. Um, I think those are probably the... the and the as a result of that, do they get better teachers? Um, some get much better teachers. Those that do it correctly get much better teachers. Uh, Lindsay Cruz, who's a graduate of Columbia, is, is here and she's helping on recruiting for, for Uncommon Schools, which runs uh, Excellence. And I think that at Excellence, they see something like a thousand applicants. Is that right for every teaching position, Lindsay? Is that roughly right? More or less. Um, that's, that's, oh, look, I feel like Rudy Giuliani. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Boy, is that a cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you don't have that luxury if you're running a, a district school all the time to choose from a thousand applicants to fill every position. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in deference to your feet, why don't we take two more questions. Uh, I think we have a question over on this side. Good evening, Chancellor Klein. Given that the city is home to so many immigrants from all over the world, what steps are, is the system taking to make sure that the children of immigrants, legal or illegal, are not marginalized in the educational system? And secondly, the question is, in charter schools, do you seem to have the same problem? I don't think so. I, I think we are making progress. Look, we have in New York City about 14 or 15 percent of our students are what we call English language learners. And some of them arrive here with no formal education. They can be 14 years old from a country. So it's, it's an incredible challenge. We have done several things. One, we have tried to, to the extent we can, standardize our English language teaching so that in the course of any program, increasingly students are being taught in English. So you might have, for, for example, math classes early on. And I think that's important. We have a lot of bilingual programs. Second, we have the most dual language programs in the entire nation. So we have schools like Xuan Wen, which we did down in Chinatown, which has got many kids who speak Mandarin, but many kids whose native language is English. And by the time they graduate, kids are fluent in both. We have some West Side schools that have dual language in Spanish. We opened up a school recently in Arabic. We have some in French and Haitian Creole. Third thing we've done is open up more international schools in the city where we try to bring together the expertise for people to be able to teach those students. I don't want to gainsay the challenge, and I just said in Albany yesterday, for them not to take into account in funding formulas how many people we have who come to New York City that are different from any other part of the state. And many of them, as I said, not when they're in kindergarten or first grade, and the natures of those challenges. We're also opening up, to the extent we can afford it, Saturday programs for the parents, many of whom also don't speak English, so that we can try to get the parents and the kids on the same track. There's a lot more we could do, take a lot more resources, but I do think over the last five to six years, we've really made a major dent in terms of addressing this problem. Thank you. Thank do we you. have another question from that side of the room? Yes. Hi, my name is Ravika, and I work for a nonprofit organization called the HOPE Program in downtown Brooklyn. And many of our um, participants come from areas like Bed-Stuy and other areas um, around the city, and are reading and doing math at the fourth grade level or fifth grade le level, or are illiterate. So what are we doing for the adults in these neighborhoods to get them the education that they need, and how are we helping them to participate in their, their children's education since they haven't been exposed to such a good system? Um, I would think it's not just the chancellor and the schools and the principals and the teachers, but a big part of is it the parents also. David, do you want to take a shot at that first? We're not doing enough. Um, the HOPE program is a terrific organization and I'm lucky enough it to... It is, I agree. <laughs> and, and, and I'm lucky enough to have 
known your work for a decade and a half or more, and I'm glad that Robinhood is one of your partners. We um, are too. We need more programs like HOPE that work with adults to make sure that they get all the supports they need so that they can become terrific employees for companies in New York City and terrific parents for children who are in Joel's schools. Joel, do you want to add anything? I mean, it's a real challenge. What I would say is the following. You know, I think you've got to prioritize things. And to me, in America, we have got to prioritize K-12 education. Indeed, with the codicil that the first questioner raised, I, I think starting much earlier. And you can't, if you try to do everything, you're not going to do things as well as you can. And I think we are missing a huge bet on the transformation of what we can do in education. And that, at least for me, is going to be my number one priority. Getting the parents involved, doing a lot of adult education, certainly doing adult literacy, these are all critical things that we need to support. But in the end, we have got to prioritize. There's something wrong with a nation in which so many kids are not making it through high school. And you can correlate that to poverty and skin color and recent immigration status almost perfectly. And we have got to fix that problem. And we know from places like Excellence that we can fix it. I just want to end on a story about Excellence. Before I knew what their grades were, I went there. Dave and others said, come see the school. We, we built it together with Robin Hood. And I walked in. And it's an, you know, African-American males are the lowest performing cohort in our city. I walked in, and a young man just was walking the hall, bumped into me. He said, good morning, Chance, or kid in kindergarten. Now, first of all, Nobody knows who a chance. You know, if I, go, if I go to a public school, a good day is somebody says, who's that, the mayor? I mean, nobody has a clue who a chance is. I said, good morning, young man. What's your name? He said, my name is Jamal Chancellor. I said, Jamal, what are you doing here at Excellence Academy? Right? This kid looks at me right in the eye and says, well, I'm in the University of Pennsylvania program. I said, Jamal, I said, you're in kindergarten. What do you mean you're in the, what do you mean you're in the University of Pennsylvania program? You know what he says to me? He says, well, you know, Chancellor, I'm on my way to college, and it's never too young to start thinking about it. Now, when every kid who grows up in poverty and every kid in Bed-Stuy says to you, I'm on my way to college when they're in kindergarten, and it's never too young to think about it, we will have affected a transformation in public education. We will let our kids set the expectations for which we as adults have been deficient. There's a billion things we can do, but it's much easier to cure poverty if you start at infancy than if you start at adulthood, and we should get serious about it. I, I, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Uh, let me thank our two guests tonight. Uh, this, this was a terrific program, and thanks to all of you for, for turning out for it. Hold on, hold on one moment. I don't have much voice left, but I did have a couple things I wanted to say. First, um, I think we should start a movement right now, tonight, a political movement to compel the next mayor of New York City to reappoint Joel Klein Chancellor. Okay, no good deed goes on punished, so I, I, I thought you were going to start the Klein for Mayor hey. program tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to uh, do some thanks very briefly. I want to uh, first and foremost thank the staff of the Social Enterprise Program for doing all the work that made this very nice evening possible. And I want to I want to single out Paige Miner in particular, who is our coordinator of events, and she really had a big job. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paige. And I also wanted to thank. Cecily Carson, I don't, I can't, my eyes are not good enough to see. <laughs> Cecily, <laughs> Cecily um, had a unique role in assembling this cast of characters, and I wanted to thank her for her perspicacity in doing so. Um, and finally, I just wanted to thank the three of you. It was a really notable evening in the history of the Social Enterprise Program, and we're all deeply indebted uh, for your taking the time and making the commitment that you've made. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>